it is the hugest honor for me to be podcast interviewing today the most famous oral surgeon I know. Uh, the, I mean, Bill Schaefer from the United Kingdom. I mean, really, dude, on Dentaltown, you're a legend. You got 2,000 posts. You're an oral surgeon. You're a medical doctor. Your implant cases are mind-blowing. Uh, and and I, I don't want to throw you under a bus, but and some of it's very controversial because you're known for doing some shorter implants. And, and you, you've really been educating me and all my friends that you don't have to have a mile-long little nail. Uh, you can have a much shorter, whiter, fatter implant and get the same result. And, and, and you're such a gentleman, too. too. I don't know how you do it because some people will say, you know, you can't do an 8-millimeter implant. And you're like, okay, you may be right. I, I could be wrong. But unfortunately, I've done a gazillion of them, and they all work. But um, so first of all, th thanks for doing this uh, podcast today. So I want, I want to ask you, um, first of all, um, since probably 80% of our viewers are Americans, what is the implant market like in the United Kingdom? Is it growing? Is it flat? Uh, well, it's for me, it's fantastic because the implant market in the UK is incredibly small, which means that there's only one way for it to go. It can't get worse. Uh, so in terms of most of Europe, we're right at the bottom of implants per capita of population. But, you know, that means that we can take a big sh share of it. It's great. And more and more people are doing it. In, in the UK, the, the health service, which is a large portion of dentistry, is being, being uh, screwed for money more and more and more. There's less money available. So more patients are realizing that you do get what you pay for. Great for me. So let, uh, let's, uh, let, let's talk about that because a lot of Americans, um, they think they, the dental industry is controlled by insurance. But, you know, when you go lecture in countries like India and China and Brazil where they don't have dental insurance, you realize, well, you know, you can have dentistry without insurance. Describe the NHS. Is it growing, contracting, flat? You know, where was it 10 years ago? Where do you think it'll be 10 years from now? Uh, I think it'll be very different in 10 years. Um, in the UK, uh, pretty much all healthcare, or the majority of healthcare, is paid for by taxation. So there's very little insurance. Uh, insurance tends to be for the wealthier part of the population. Uh, so people have become used to not having to pay for their healthcare because it's paid for by taxes. They don't have to put their money in there. They don't have to get their wallet out when they have dentistry, for example. Now, that's not quite true because you pay a, a small amount. So it's, it's, um, it's, it's partly funded by the government and partly funded by the patient. The problem is it's, it's kind of a race to the bottom. They, the government are paying the dentist less and less. The, the dentists are doing less and less and there's lots of supervised neglect. There are still lots of dentists doing their best under the NHS, but more and more dentists are saying, enough, we can't do it like this. I can't provide good dental care like this. I'm going to go private. Now, implants aren't available on the NHS, so I don't have to deal with the NHS. I only do private work. So I have, I have heard numbers saying that when I got out of school in 87, 20 years ago, that there were about 14,000 dentists in the UK all practicing under the NHS. And now 20 years later, probably 5,000 of them have dropped out and just do uh, private insurance and cash. And only maybe uh, 9,000 still do NHS entirely. Are those numbers, is that about right or is that completely off base? Uh, I'm, I'm not an NHS dentist, so I don't know the figures. I can tell you that there are about 22,000 dentists who practice regularly uh, in the UK. Uh, I would have expected the majority of those to do some NHS. Some dentists will only do NHS, but most will do a mixture. More and more dentists are saying, I cannot work within the system. I can't do the best for my patients, so I'll only take patients privately. Okay. And more and more patients are really everything you get what you pay for. Okay, tell us your journey because, um, you know, in, in the United States, uh, you know, we, we hear in that Korea has 20,000 dentists and 15,000 of them will place an implant every month. 
Uh, we hear that in Germany, three out of four German dentists will place an implant every month. In America, probably 95% of the general dentists have never placed one implant in their life. So walk us through your journey. How, what happened to you when you got out of dental school? How did, how did you, you get interested in implants? And what, what, how, did, how did your journey get you to be an implantologist full time? Uh, I, I never, uh, all my way through dental school, I never kind of pictured myself being a general dentist. And when I when I qualified as a as a dentist from dental school, I then went and started working in hospitals doing max facts, maxillofacial surgery. Did more and more, got as far as I could go without doing medicine. And when I did medicine, for me that was just a logical progression. There wasn't. Uh, there wasn't any question about it. That's what I was going to do. I wanted to be a maxillofacial consultant. Uh, when I got through my medical degree, uh, things had changed a lot in the health service. The funding had been cut a lot. Uh, staff were overworked. Uh, just resources tightened and tightened and tightened because hospital-based treatment is all uh, funded by the, by the government, the NHS, and you know we've been going through some, some tough times. So I got my surgeon's qualification uh, and looked around at all the consultants that I wanted to aspire to be like, and they were having a miserable time. Now, fortunately, I paid my way through a medical degree by doing a mixture of working in hospitals, doing max facts, and doing oral surgery and dental practices. And one of those dental practices started me off putting implants in. Uh, and I thought, Do you know what, I can carry on doing this as a business. I went to the bank, gave them some figures, didn't realize that was a business plan. I didn't know what a business plan was. <laughs> gave some figures that seemed to make sense. Bank thought so too. They lent me some money and I started going around to different dental practices. At that time, I didn't know anybody who did that. I kind of, I made this up. Uh, and it grew and grew and grew. Very quickly, I stopped having the time to go and work in hospitals and I was just going around to people putting implants in. Uh, uh, one of my very good friends, Guy Barwell, came into business with me, started doing the same. And quickly it got to the point where uh, we, were too, we had too many patients to go and see them. And what we needed was to set up our own place where they come and see us. So we set up our first site in 2006. We set up our second site uh, four years ago now. And now we place 1% of all the implants placed in the United Kingdom. And because you are that elite, and like I say, I'm not, I'm not blowing smoke up. I'm not trying to flatter you. I mean, you're, I, I consider you, I, 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 I what's that? I mean, I, 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 can't, I, I, I can't think of a more elite implantologist. I, I, I really can't. I, I don't know who it would be. Um, and especially now that Brandmark passed away, <laughs> but I want to, um, I, I want to go right to the controversial, the 4,000 pound elephant in the room that people are trying to avoid the conversation. Um, first, um, you are known on this controversial deal of you're, you're putting in much shorter, wider, fatter implants. Will you, you talk about that? Um, tell us what your thoughts are on that and why you're doing a lot of shorter implants instead of longer, narrower implants. Okay. I don't go wide. I don't, in, in the main implant system I use, we stock two widths, three and a half millimeters and four and a half millimeters. We don't stock anything wider. So I have no problems with people putting wide implants in or narrow implants, but I only have a choice of two. We don't stock anything wider than make them wider, but I don't see the reason to use them. So for me, I, I, I have two widths and I have a choice of lengths. I used to do what every Every other implantologist starts doing, and, and most still do. You look at the available bone and you think, what's the longest implant I can get in there? So you kind of look at the x-ray and you go, well, can I get a 12 millimeter in there? Oh, no, it's not enough. So, oh, well, I have to go down to a, to a nine and a half. Or may, maybe, like, maybe I'll have to only be able to put in an, an eight. For me, I know my shortest implant will work. So my thought process is, can I put a, for my system, it's 6.6 .6 millimeters long. Can I put a 6.6 .6 in? Yeah, fine. End of. I don't have to think any way past that. A 6.6 .6 for me, I know works. We place three of them every day, just over three of them every day. If they didn't work, we'd know about it. Do you, do you think it's, it comes from the old school that we were taught the crown to root ratio, the crown should be, the root should be twice as long as the crown? Do you think that's the brain 
activity that's making them go long or are they just thinking, well, if six is good, 12 is twice as good? Yeah, and, and I think a lot of people think that. I, I think it's a mixture of things. Certainly, short implants on a machine surface don't work well. They don't. A third of them will fail. Um, but we don't use machine surface implants anymore. We, we use modern rough surface implants, and short works just fine with those. I think there's a legacy from the, the old school of machined. I think there's a legacy of looking at implants and expecting them to be the same as teeth. And to be honest, for me now, the short implants I use, they look normal to me because I'm using them every day. But I can understand how freaky they look to anybody else. They look strange. You've got to get used to it. So um, for me, it kind of, it looked strange to me when I put a long one in. And I put long ones in, you know, I put as many long ones as I put short ones. And, and what, what, what system are, you said you're using two systems. What are they? I used Ankylos as my main system, and I used Bicon as well. I was brought up on Bicon. Bicon was the implant system that I started with, and I have a lot of love for the system. I think it's a fantastic, fantastic one. Uh, there were lots of reasons why uh, we chose to use Ankylos as, as our main system. Um, really, it's all about getting referring dentists to restore the implants we placed. We thought that it would be easier with Ankylos. And who makes, who makes Ankylos? And where is that made? Ankylos is a company called Dentsply. Oh, de okay. That's Dentsply system. Okay. And and who makes Bicon? Bicon. But, I mean, where are they out of? Oh, they're, they're in Boston. They're in Boston. Bicon stands for an implant consortium. Bicon stands for what? Boston Implant Consortium? The Boston Implant Consortium. Yeah. Right, all right. And, and talk, talk again about the surfaces. Do, do um, Ankylos and Bicon have the same type of surface? You're saying it's not a machine smooth surface. You're just looking for a rough surface, or is there a specific type of rough surface? Uh, uh, who cares? It's all marketing. Uh, these days, everybody's got a medium rough surface that works. Uh, we've been through all the the uh, uh, the mistakes that were made making them too rough or not making them rough enough blasting them with this or that it doesn't matter it's all marketing hype well uh, the, these the, days the biggest the, the all biggest. medium rough surfaces on implant but you and i are old enough to remember back in the day when they used to put a ha coating on it and then the coating was coming off yep. so do you, do you yeah. do any do you do any ha coating anymore or any anything like what are your thoughts on that the part of the problem that you have with HA coated was the implant manufacturers used to uh, recommend that they were used to poor quality bone. So they had the same sized implant, machined implant, and they sprayed an HA coating on it, which made the implant wider. Not massively wider, but a bit wider. The coating was often quite crystalline. So when you screwed an implant, plant in with an HA coating, it would often shear off because it wasn't bonded very well onto the implant and that created problems. I've placed hmm, over a thousand HA coated Bicon implants, but these, they're push fit. You don't screw them in. So there's no shearing off of the HA coating. It works absolutely brilliantly. So it's a different coating. It's a thin coating, not a thick coating. It's amorphous, not crystalline. It's a push fit, not a screw type implant. Yeah, it, most people quite rightly don't use HA because you don't need to anymore. You've got grit blasted acid etched surfaces that work just fine. Okay, I want to ask you a couple more um, uh, interesting questions. Um, one of the biggest controversies in America between the uh, surgeons, like oral surgeons who have placed, you know, several thousand implants and general dentists yep. who are starting implants, the, the older surgeons are always telling me kind of angrily that they're, they're not a fan of surgical guides. They, they think that, um, and, we're, and we're talking about single tooth replacement, which 95% of all crowns made in America are made one crown at a time, and 95% of all implants placed are one implant at a time. We're just talking about the single tooth, that you need to be a surgeon. You need to sit there and be able to lay back the tissue, a full flip, the flap, 
Look at the bone. You got a tooth in front and a tooth behind. You got the buccal angle. Come on, dude. Be a real surgeon and do it. And they don't like um, a cat, uh, a CBCT 3D x-ray machine making a surgical guide. And they, they think that's training wills. And you're never going to learn to be a great surgeon with a surgical guide. So my controversial question to you is if this dentist, 5,000 of them are driving to work right now, listen to you on iTunes, uh, listen to the audio. Um, if they were going to place their, they've never placed an implant. They were going to learn how to place an implant. Would you recommend them going down a road of, um, of a 3D x-ray and making a surgical guide to help them place it right? Or would you say, no, come on, you need to, need to learn how to lay a flap and be a surgeon. How would you answer that question? Uh, I'd answer it the same as if a surgeon asked me how they should place their first implant. Get a 3D scan, make a surgical guide. Now, a surgeon might be very good at raising flaps and stitching afterwards, but there's a new skill that they've got to learn. When you place your first implant, you've, you've got to learn how to get over the, the, the visual clues that are throwing you off in the wrong directions, and there are many. For, for you in America, for us in the UK, for me and my business, the majority of implants we place are single implants. You would think that it's really hard to screw it up when you're just putting it between two teeth. It's incredibly easy to screw it up. <laughs> <laughs> I've screwed up plenty of implant placement that, that I should have known better about. Now, I would completely agree that with experience comes the ability to be able to place them better and mess up less often. But to begin with, you've got to, you've really got to have a surgical guide and have a CT scan. If you're not, you're just going blind. You need all the help you, you can get when you're starting out. If you're hugely experienced, then you can cut some of the corners safely. But you've got to know which corners to cut. So everybody should start with 3D CT scans and surgical guides, even the best maxillofacial surgeon. Okay, well, let's talk about that. What There's a... You know, when you, when you walk into the Cologne meeting in Germany last March, March there were 145 um, implant companies that had a booth selling implants, and that's overwhelming to, you know, my motto with Dentaltown is I'm trying to create a community so that no one has to practice alone. So what would you say to a person who says, well, I want to get into this, and there's 145 companies selling implants, and back to the CBCT, I mean, there, there, there's a dozen CBCTs. So you told us you went with Bicon and Ankylos, and Ankylos was your go-to system. What CBCT and what surgical guide system did you choose? Okay, we've got two uh, Cambium CT scanners, one at each of our centers. They're both made by a, a South Korean company called Iwu or Iwu Vartek. So, now, spell, spell out that. I, I, hear, I hear that all, all over the world. Um, um, Spell it e e -woo. The e -woo is spelled as it sounds. Uh, echo, uh, what's W in phonetic alphabet? I don't know. William Oscar Oscar. So E W double O. And then the second word is Vatek. V A T E C H. And those are both. Those are two different companies, both uh, South Korean. It's all one. It's all one word. It's all what? Sorry, one company. Oh, e -woo Vatek. Yeah. Yeah. Is that, yeah, I, I hear great things about that because I hear the quality is great and the price is low. You can't complain about that. Uh, we've had, we've had no problems. Um, we bought the first Ewu Vartek machine in the UK. What year was that? Uh, uh, we bought it without having it. So again, ha that was 2006. Okay. Uh, we hadn't seen an Ewu Vartek machine so we kind of bought it off spec and we, we almost wondered whether we'd been conned in an internet scam but fortunately the machine did turn up and it did work and it's been great it works so well we bought a second one from the same company so you have two of those yeah, yeah. Oh, okay and and then talk us about your surgical guide technique do you make your surgical guides do you send the the cbct file through dicom to a lab and they fabricate it how, tell, tell us how you make a surgical guide I no longer use uh, computer-generated surgical guides. When they first came out, I embraced them. I thought they would be the future of implantology. So I was uh, 
charter member of the Simplant Academy, member of the Kai Academy, Simplant Pro user. I did a lot. And uh, I came to realize that it wasn't uh, foolproof. It just provided a way of making different mistakes. I think it is fantastic for uh, beginners. Um, however, you've still got to be very aware of um, the mistakes that can still be created even when you use one of these guides. It's much it's much uh, better when you're just doing single tooth replacements because you can really lock it on those adjacent teeth. But if you're doing full arch, full mouth cases, there's a bit more give in them. Now, uh, for me, I haven't done a guided case using computer guides for about four or five years now. And I was a huge fan of them before that time. Now I have my own laboratory. Um, so we make our own guides. They're not computer-generated guides. Um, I use a comb beam CT scan. I use a guide showing where the tooth position is. But, but then again, I've been doing this a bit. You know, I've, I've, I've made enough mistakes to have learned how to avoid them in the future. I don't recommend that anybody copies what I do. Um, and again, you know, you, you need a bit of experience to be able to do it. But for me, I don't use any guides when I'm doing a single tooth replacement. I don't use guides when I'm doing usually a couple of teeth. Um, I will often use something that will send to me in the gap. So there are a number of different um, guides that will facilitate that, but they're not stereolithographic guides made from a okay. CT, CT scan. Okay, so you're, you're not... not um, for me, it's much because I'm not putting long implants, so I don't have to get really, really close to the nerve. I'm putting in a short implant. You know, Part of the reason people use cone beam CT scans is because they want to put that 11 millimeter implant in. So you're saying you don't use CT guides for surgical single tooth implants? but you use a lab-made guide. Are you uh, I don't use a lab-made guide unless I'm probably doing a four-unit case. I don't use it for anything else, but I'm, I'm not suggesting that anybody else should be as reckless and cavalier as I am. Okay, so, so earlier you said that you think if you were talking to another surgeon placing their first implant that they should use a surgical guide. But now you're, but but you're Absolutely. saying, but you're saying that you yourself do not use it for one or two implants. You only use it for like four or more. Actually, how would I said that if they were doing their first case or their first few cases, I would absolutely recommend they use certainly a guide and certainly a CT scan, whether it's a computer generated guide or not. You know, you, I I have. Uh, feelings for and against that or whether it's just a lab made guide made from a waxed up tooth position now again you, you know there are pros and cons to all of the do you have have your own single lab person making your surgical guides oh, we have a number of lab or, or, doing it. Yeah. but but do you send it out to a lab or do you have that lab inside your implant center or do you send it out to a lab to make we've your got, surgical uh, we've got a lab laboratory inside our implant center is it is it you have one master person that does all these guides for you no we've got a lot of people who do them. man i would do do they uh They're making the guides is so carry on do do you think you could get your lab tech to make a one-hour online ce course for dental town on how they do it um making a guide yeah i, I can I can post something on it. Look, it, it's, it's incredibly easy. All, all I want to know is, let's say if it's an upper anterior, I need to know where the labial tooth position is, where the labial surface of the teeth is. That's all I need to know. Uh, everything we do is screw retained. We, don't, we just don't do cement retained. So I've got to get my implants coming out through the occlusal surface of premolars and molars, and through the singularity of canines and incisors. That's, that's my one remit. If I'm doing bridges, I've got to get the implants parallel. So, you know, I, again, you can't do that without a bit of experience. But that's all we do. We don't do them any other way.
So when people say implants are hard to restore, they're absolutely hard to restore if you don't get them in the right place. If you get them in the right place, they're easy. But Bill, I'm telling you, I know these dentists. I, I watch them talk all day long on Dental Town, at least four or five hours a day from 98. And if you put up a one-hour course on how to make a surgical guide, it might seem like nothing to you, but it would just be hugely helpful. There are so many dentists who need to see somebody actually make a real surgical guide and be talking about it. I'll have a chat with my lab team. You know, they're the ones that do it. I didn't do it. I just use them. Yeah, that would that would be so awesome. So I want to um <clears throat> I want to go on to um other things. Um, some people are drawing blood and spinning it and centrifuging it and coming up with you know uh, PRF platelet rich fibrin. Do you think that's uh do you think that's that's something they should get into or is that something uh what what do you, what do you think about that? Uh, I first. So Joseph Shukrin, who invented platelet-rich fibrin, PRF, uh, a decade ago, 2005 in Italy. And I was so impressed with his lecture that I immediately bought the centrifuge and bought his kit and started using it. Um, so I've been using it for a decade. Um, I know it works, but it's just a tool. It's not magic. People think that it's, it's something that will let them be uh, sloppy. It's, it's just a tool. It helps things heal more quickly. If you put it in a socket, it won't uh, magically regenerate all the bone. But it will help the socket heal more quickly. If you put it in a sinus, that's a very different situation because you can put anything in a sinus. You can put nothing in a sinus. And if you put implants in, it will grow bone around the implants. All that PRF does is make that bone grow more quickly. Now, I, I simply just don't do lateral sinus grafts anymore. I do maybe two or three a year. And I, and I used to do a lot. Um, and now what I do is I do internal lifts, osteotome lifts, for one of a better word. Um, I use... Albert and Sheldon's great Crestal Lift Kit from BSB. I think it's fantastic, idiot-proof. Um, and I use platelet-rich fibrin. That's what I use. I don't use anything else. I'm making tiny incisions. I'm making small holes in the bone. Uh, you know, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm an oral surgeon. I'm a doubly qualified oral surgeon. I teach bone grafting. And yet, the less big grafting I do, the happier my patients are. God, I'd love to get that course out of you, the sign <laughs> I would so love to get that course out of you. Can I just put you to work all weekend and just make and make another one? I mean, that would be amazing to watch that because I, I, I remember we're old enough. Remember it was a Tatum down there in uh, St. Petersburg, Florida that was teaching the, the lateral sinus lifts and you would start with a boiled egg and all that stuff. And, 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 um, and now that, that that's gone. <laughs> Tatum taught me, taught me how to do, do sinus cross. And I guess he's moved. He, he left America. Someone told me he's now in France or Italy. He moved to Europe. Yeah, I think he married a French woman. Is that right? Well, I, I'd moved to France for the perfect I think woman. So. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, but he, he's as, as energetic as he always was. Yeah. Um, yeah. That 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 is that that is amazing. Um, another another thing I want to ask you about. Um, in America, I don't know. Uh, I don't know if this happened in the UK, but there's some. There's some big corporate um, four-on-the-floor implant centers where they're coming in. Some of these big cities, they do a lot of advertising, same-day implants. You, you come in there, and they, they you know, place four on the floor. And what, what, do, you, what do you think about that, uh, that, that whole concept? Have you heard about that in, in the States? Yeah, yeah. yeah absolutely. And um, if you're not involved with them, and I'm not, it's very easy to – dismiss them as cavalier or reckless or um, anything like this. And, and I must admit that for some of these centers, they've got one treatment. So if you're only missing three or four teeth, for them, realistically, it's easier for them. They're more set up to it to take out teeth and put an all on four and then placing just a few implants and doing perio and doing endo and, and so forth. But they are very well set up. They have very good training. They have very good laboratories. Which one? And Which one? It's difficult. 
Well, they have their own laboratories that they use. They have their own technicians. So, so it's difficult when they're doing the numbers that they're doing and doing them very successfully to dismiss them. They started coming into the UK and truly, for me, all they're doing is marketing implants. So if a patient hears about them and they live near me, they'll come and see me. And what, what are they called? Uh, but they've heard about it. And what are they called in the UK? Um, I'll, I'll think of it in a moment. It'll come to me in a moment. Uh, and what, what implant company I'll think owns of it. it? What what implant company owns that for on the floor? Uh, well, Noble Biocare. I'm not sure if Noble Biocare owns the company or whether uh, the company just uses Noble Biocare implants. Um, I'll think of them in a moment. Okay, and, and back to uh, – back to I, I, I want to switch gears from uh, a single tooth uh, yeah. to fully edentulous. Um, yeah. I, I, I want to I, – I always like to go – I always like to talk about the controversial things, especially when I got uh, lead guys like you. Um, there seems to be um, – on, on Dental Town, we had to separate implants from many implants because there's just – there's just too much uh, conversation. It seems, it seems to me this. Th this is the way I'm seeing it. Tell me if I'm right or wrong on that. It seems like in most countries, um, the 31 million Americans who have zero teeth, that they go to an oral surgeon or a periodontist, they they're only going to recommend a Mercedes-Benz, a Porsche, an Audi, some $50,000 full mouth rehab, you know, six implants, upper, lower. If they don't have the bone, they're going to do a lot of bone grafting, and it's going to be 12 units of fix, upper and lower, and it's going to be about 50 grand. And, but they don't offer – if someone just says, look, I don't have 50 grand. I mean I know dentists that don't have 50 grand. And, and if they say, I don't have 50 grand, and you say, okay, well, I, I got a five grand option. I'm, I'm going to use uh, 3M's uh, Imtex, and I'm going to put uh, four minis on the lower in front of the metal foramens and six minis on the upper in front of the sinuses. And, that's, and I'm going to use your existing denture, and that's going to be – that's going to give you a great service. And it seems to me that – if you post a case like that or you say you do that, the big, boy, the big boys who place thousands of only root forms, that they don't place minis. And there's just – like minis are just like – like you're a lesser primate if you're placing minis and real men place full root form implants. So, so I want to ask you, what, what, do, what do you think of that? Assessment? I mean I, I get that feeling a lot, and I've had a lot of people – who place 500 minis a year, and we're only talking fully dentalist. It's usually a grandma. It's usually a 65 to 85 year old woman who probably only has a yeah. 25, 40 pound bite force. She's not like a big guy like you that probably bites 150 pounds. And I know you're in the United Kingdom, so you don't even know what a pound is. It's probably a, or a kilogram over there now, or you're more advanced than us. But uh, uh, what, what, what do you think about minis? Uh, I think there are many right ways of treating any patient. And, you know, you go out and there are a whole range of cars you could buy from the Mercedes-Benz down to the Skoda Lada. Why shouldn't there be different treatments for implants? Um, uh, for me, that you, you see me post on Dental Town. I get all the while that can't possibly work being told. I get told what you're doing cannot possibly work. And... <laughs> yeah. And you're such a gentleman minis, about it. I you're such a gentleman implants. about it. But, but it's true. But I, it, they work. Now, now I, I, I don't put fixed restorations on my mini implants. Right. Right. We're only talking fully um, dentalists. I know that people do. Yeah, and I know that people do in fully dentalists put lots of minis and put fixed restorations on them. Um, and you know what? They work for them. I, I personally don't do that, but I use them in the mandible for holding dentures. They work great for that. What, they what, work. What, what's your technique for a fully dentalist that can't afford uh, full root forms and fixed bridge? What, what, what is your mini um, treatment plan, your lower priced mini implant treatment plan for, for a fully dentalist lady? I put four minis in and we use their, well, we rarely are able to use their denture because usually their denture is pretty crummy. Um, as usually it's poorly extended. Usually it's the OVD is wrong. So uh, it is rare that we're able to use their denture. So normally we make them a, a new set of dentures and 
put four minis in and O-ring housings to clip them on. The downside of that is that that takes quite a lot of maintenance, um, more maintenance than a fix does. So you've got to change those O-rings regularly. You've got to reline and remake the denture as they continue to get resorption. Otherwise, as the mandible resorbs posteriorly, you end up with the denture high and dry on the minis. But you know, provided the patients are aware of that up front, it works great. It works fantastically. And how often do you have to change the O-rings? And how often would you have to reline it? Uh, change the O-rings, usually a minimum of every six months. It's very quick to do, but there's a cost implication for the patient for that. And it depends on how recently the teeth were taken out for how quick you need a reline. If, if the denture's really moving around, yeah, you need to have a reline or a remake. Um, and it, it's all about how quickly the mandible is resorbing. And do you mostly do four minis on the lower uh, for a new lower denture, or are you also placing uh, equal amount of uh, six in the maxillary? I don't do any implant, any minis in the maxilla. You don't for do me, any? For me, no, for, for me, um, we've struggled to make tissue supported upper dentures work on implants. They work great if they're implant supported, lots of ways of doing that, but tissue supported, we struggle. We just can't make them work predictably. Um, they come loose. They, they, we find that they don't work in our hands as well as we would like them to. In the mandible, you're just putting four in the front. They work fine. And how do you, and what is your uh, uh, technique to avoid uh, placing one in the metal foramen? How, how do you stay in front of the metal foramen? What is your technique? Because, I mean, that's everyone's scare of four minis in front of the metal foramen is that at the anterior loop of the metal foramen. Yeah. Um, well, with minis, you, you don't have to get too close to the, to the mental nerves. It depends on whether you're raising a flap or doing it flapless. If you're raising a flap, you just take a look at where the nerve is. If you're doing it flapless and most of the place are flapless, then I, I make two little marks and put some uh, temporary filling material in the denture, two little dents, put them in the denture, get the patient to bite together, having a CT scan. So I get an idea of where the mark is on the denture, where the mark is in relation to the gum, and where that mark is in relation to the mental nerve. It's just a guide. But basically, you want to stay further away from the nerve than get too close to it if you can't see it. So, so you basically do not do many implants in the maxillary denture. I mean, that, that's a fair yeah. assessment. Okay. Yeah. And, uh, and you, um, and, and just, just trying to get a market segmentation price. Um, if one of your options was four mini implants in the lower and the new denture, about what would that cost versus, and what yeah. would be yeah. the, what would be the Mercedes dream plan? Would that be six implants and a 12 unit fixed bridge? Um, when I do a full arch, it doesn't matter. They don't get paid per implant. So if they've got loads of bone and I can put six implants in, I'll put six in. If they've got hardly any bone and I squeeze four implants, they get four. It's the same cost. Uh, for me, it's a full arch. Or for the patient, it's a full arch. It's a full set of fixed teeth. And when we're doing it, I these days, I immediately load everything. Uh, and I do them in, a, in a, a technique called the cometric technique, and I weld intraorally. So there's a lot going on for that. If we're doing four minis in the lower, and they get one denture that clips on, that's £3,000. If I'm doing uh, a full arch fixed bridge with sedation, extractions, osteoplasty, implants, uh, intraoral welding, immediate load, and then the more permanent bridge later on, that's £18,000. Okay. So, so it's six to one. Price, but there's a big difference in product. So it's six to one. Yeah. So it's six times more expensive, £18 to uh, 3 And just for our American viewers, what's the pound trading to the U.S. dollar these days? Uh, I, mean, what, what's, yeah, uh, I have no idea. Okay. And uh, – so, 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 do you have any middle of the road treatment? Do you do you have a uh, 
a six, nine, or ten thousand dollar middle treatment, or is it basically two cars, either a three thousand mini yeah, and an eighteen? You what? Ten thousand. That's a removable implant supported bridge. So it's it's again it's conometric, but it's much more like a, like a denture that clips on securely onto the uh, implants. Uh, it works great, but it's it's bigger than a fixed bridge. Uh, you have to take it out to clean it. Uh, it's bulkier, but it's solid, strong. They can eat whatever they like with it. Uh, relatively maintenance free. And um, um, and then I'm going to throw out some other questions, just some rare questions that you still you still see people wondering. Oh, um, sometimes people will want to do a three unit bridge, and one tooth is a natural tooth and the other abutment is an implant good idea bad idea a three unit bridge one end implant uh, one end tooth um that's never something that we like or enjoy doing we do very very little of it for me i would much much rather put one implant and cantilever a unit off it and we do that all the time so for me that makes much more sense than trying to connect it with the tooth and then I, I want to switch gears from uh, – well, and first of all, I, I'm answering these questions, and I'm, I'm probably not smart enough to even be as, asking you the questions. Uh, is there any anything that you would like to share with people placing implants instead of the beginner, but they, the, the people have done a 1,000 implants? What, what, did, what do you think you know um, that a guy that's placed, uh, you know, 100 implants doesn't know? What, what, what do you think are some elite tips that you might uh, be able to share right now to the – Listeners out there that say, come on, I, I'm an advanced implant guy. Tell me something I don't know. Uh, I, I don't know what they don't know. The tips <laughs> that I can uh, suggest are um, it's always human error. It's never the equipment. So when there's a mistake, we all hate to blame ourselves, but it's almost always our fault. Assume that you are human and you are trying hard to make mistakes because they'll happen even if you don't want them to. So look for it. Try and do things. Try and adopt a behavior that acknowledges that human error is a fact of life and try and trap those mistakes before they happen. So for implants, a really simple way of avoiding Many of the mistakes is when you drill your first pilot hole, stop, take an x-ray. You will be amazed at, at, at where your drill actually is compared with where you thought it was. It allows you to stop or to change tack. And that's a very simple way of avoiding an embarrassing placement. Because let's face it, it's always embarrassing when you screw up. But we we're gonna screw up you just got to try and try and uh, have a system that acknowledges that and traps human mistakes whenever you can and that's why uh it's so important uh that when you turn 50 you get a colonoscopy because usually the colonoscopy surgeon they usually find your head there and uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm 50 next year. You're 50 next year. Yeah, I got my my first one at 50. I'm 52, and uh, that's what the the colonoscopy doctor said. He says, "By the way, I you had no polyps, but I did find your head." <laughs> hey, and, and so any any other tips? I mean, I I feel like I got an elite guy on there, and I know there's a lot of uh, oral surgeons and periodontists that place lots of implants on there. And, and do you think there's any other tips for uh, those guys that have placed a thousand? Yeah, yeah. Don't be be afraid of going short. That the, the uh, uh, again, I, I get asked all the time, why are you so afraid of doing bone grafts so that you can get a longer implant in? What I now say to people, I say, why are you so afraid of short implants that you put a patient through an unnecessary bone graft just so you can get a longer one in? You don't need it. Stay a long way away from the nerve. If you could get a 12 millimeter implant in, but you're gonna get close to the nerve, put an eight millimeter implant in and stay miles away from the nerve. 
Error the mic longer one isn't better. They work. Be safe. Keep your blood pressure down. You know at our age, Howard, our blood pressure becomes important to us. If I'm doing stuff that gets me really close to a nerve and I don't need to, then I'm unnecessarily raising my blood pressure. I'm unnecessarily putting that patient at risk. You know, I'm not worried about high blood pressure or getting old because I heard old age doesn't last very long. <laughs> um, you know, you know, you know what this kind of reminds me of. You know, you cut off him. Anyway, did you hear my joke? Yeah, I did. I did. Um, it kind of reminds me. You know, when I got out of school in '87, the only way to properly do a root canal was the first appointment, clean it all out and everything, and then medicate it, and then wait two or three weeks to make sure it's okay, and then obturate in the second appointment. And and back in '87, if you said, "Well, I'm going to do the whole root canal in one appointment." Hey, it's not, well, you're, you're just a bad guy. I mean, you're just cutting corners. And, and uh, so there's always, there's always that human nature thing where the hardest path is always the best path. And I, I get that because I, I think one of the best pieces of advice I always give my kids is that, you know, when you come to a fork in the road, one, you know, you're trying to get to the top of the mountain. When you come to a fork of the road, one's gonna, one, one, one choice is going to be an uphill hard path that scares you. And the other one's going to be downhill and easy. And if you just always take the uphill hardest path, Every decision, you know, you come to a fork in the road, which one scares you? That's the right move. So I think dentists are just, you know, they're super achievers. You know, they, they made it, they, 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 they become doctors. And so they just think, oh, my God, you know, I'll, I'll get that implant one micron from the nerve. And, you know, and they, when you tell them just to relax and put in an eight, you know, it's, just, it's counterintuitive. It's counterintuitive to a super achiever doctor. Um, any, any, any other things that you might think uh, um, an elite guy a tip for an elite one. Yeah, it's, I've never regretted not placing an implant. I've regretted placing lots of implants. I've regretted taking patients on, but I've never regretted turning a patient down because they're not my problem anymore. And just be aware of the fact that all of your problems come from treatment planning and case selection. They will. They will all come from that. Knowing what you, you are able to achieve for these patients and knowing what you're not. When we're beginners, we let the patient dictate lots of stuff for us. We say to them, when we're beginners, you're going to need to leave this implant to integrate for three months. And they say, well, I'm getting married in two months. It's got to all be finished by then. Can't you do it? Can't you, can't you just shorten it? And we go, oh, well, kind of thing. Oh. All right, then. And we go against our better judgment. Listen to that little voice in your head that's telling you what is right. Um, case selection is everything. Treatment planning is everything. And you don't have to treat everyone that comes through your door. Yeah, and I want to give an advice to dentists. I think this is really good advice. I think since dentists uh, got A's in calculus and physics and geometry and trig and all that stuff, you know what I think the problem is with the little voice in their head, the little birdie on their shoulder? Since they're so damn smart, they're always debating with the birdie on their shoulder. They're always arguing with the voice. And as you get older, you realize, you know, I quit arguing with the little birdie on your shoulder. When, you, when he starts screaming, just stop. Just stop. I know you're smart, but don't argue with the birdie. Just when the birdie's saying stop, just stop. Uh, I want so you you asked, um, asked uh, or, or brought up another controversial subject: immediate load or not? What what does your implants have to torque out to before you you'll immediate load? What and and when should you not um, immediate load? And and what would be a bad uh, torque out where you say no, we're going to bury this thing for three months and come back and load it later? So it's slightly different for me. I, I don't. I'm, well, I do own a torque wrench that that I can measure what the torque is, but I never use it. It's never open. Um, for me, uh, again, I've I've been doing it a little bit for Anklos. If you put them in too hard, then you break the carrier. So I don't want so much torque that I break the carrier because that's just a pain. Um, if the torque is too low you have to hold the carrier to unscrew it because otherwise you unscrew the implant. For me, when I'm doing an immediate load, if, it's, if I'm splinting implants together, I don't care what the torque is. I just don't care. If I'm not splinting them together, I want to try and get at the upper end of those two limits. 
I don't want it so high that I break the carry out. I don't want it so loose that I unscrew the implant with the, um, uh, when I take off the carrier. It's kind of my, for immediate loading, I, I, you want a decent amount, but I don't have a number for you because I never measured the numbers. For me, the one thing that, that I look at is uh, I, do a, I do almost everything one stage. So I put a healing cap on straight away at the time of surgery. I don't bury many implants. And if I can take the carrier off without unscrewing the implant, that's fine for me to put a, a healing cap, a focus form on. That's, that's the only kind of measure I use. If, if I have to hold the carrier to unscrew it, then for me, um, I, I need to bury that implant. Uh, and I want to ask you another thing. Uh, you're, you're a specialist. You're an oral surgeon. You're a dentist, an oral surgeon, a medical doctor. Um, what, 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 what do you think of, uh, I mean, we, the, the market has two skill sets. You've got general dentist placing implants with a fraction of the training you do. Um, what, what do you think about specialists versus uh, general dentist placing implants? Uh, uh, look, there's lots of things that general dentists do that I would be absolutely dreadful at. I haven't prepped a tooth. I haven't done a filling since dental school. Um, so we have different skill sets, but that doesn't mean a general dentist can't place implants. Equally, it also doesn't mean that a you know, maxillofacial surgeon can't extirpate a pulp when it's called for. Now, as long as you know where your skill set lies, uh, some, of, some of my best mentors have been general dentists who are just legends at implants. Their skill set has grown over the years until they are way better than I will ever be. Um, why should I then start suggesting that general dentists shouldn't do implants? All you should do is know what your limits are. I, I, I know that I, I would be useless at treating teeth. I haven't done it for 25 years. Uh, I know that I can do certain things with implants that some people might not be able to. But as long as you know where your own limits are, just, just stay within your own, um, you know, stay within your own abilities. Now, that doesn't mean that if your own abilities don't include something that you want to do, that you shouldn't get training and do it, but get the training and do it. It's fine. If you want to learn how to do sinus scrubs, go on sinus scrubs course. If you want to, I don't know, learn how to immediately load, go on a course that's immediate loading or grafting or whatever it is you want to learn. And GDPs can do courses and learn just as well as oral surgeons can. And um, have you ever been to Las Vegas? I've never been. No, I've never been. Why don't you come to Las Vegas some year, any year? At the, we have a townie meeting there. We have it every year, 13 years in a row. It's always in April. Uh, it's always like the last weekend of April or whatever, but, uh, would you think we'd ever fly to go to Las Vegas and, uh, uh, come, uh, give a course on, uh, on implants? I, 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 I already have to explain to my wife why I spend so much time on dental town, let alone take a holiday out there as well. So I don't, I'll have to get it past my wife. Well, you have to get it past, past your wife. We'll, we'll run it by her. Uh, that would, that would be, uh, an amazing, I, I think that'd be fun. So I would have. I've only got you. I, I'm almost done. I, I, um, we're at 53 minutes. I only got you seven minutes. So I want to switch gears uh, completely away from implants and go to the business of implants. I mean, you have an implant center. Um, what have you learned over the years about like um, running the business of an implant center, marketing, advertising? How do you get um, patients? Are all of yours mostly coming from uh, general dentists referring an implant to their buddy Bill to place it? Or are you doing any uh, direct consumer business advertising, trying to get them off the street like uh, All On 4 does? Or what, what, what are you doing? What's your business model and marketing? We do, every, we do everything. We market at every possible uh, avenue that we can. For, for us, um, I'm sure you know that there are specialists who will take your referrals who, who will think that they are very, very clever people. And they are clever. They're specialists. They're very good at what they do. And therefore, if they place an implant, they think that the only person who's really capable of restoring that implant is themselves. Because if you let an outside dentist restore it, they could mess it up. 
Um, and so they will never have a big business. When we started uh, with our first center, we had two surgeons and one restorative dentist. So we, we were placing twice as many implants as we could restore ourselves. We had to encourage and train and support our referring dentist to restore the implants we placed. We had to make it as easy as possible. And you know what? They had fun doing it. It was profitable for them. They're they liked it. So they sent us more patients. They told their colleagues, they sent us patients. You've got to, um, if you want people to refer to you, you've got to help those referrers to restore the implants at your place. You've got to make it easy for them. And that's what we did. Um, in terms of marketing, we market to those dentists, we train them, we provide CPD days for them, we provide equipment, support, mentoring they can come to us we can go to them for the patients we'll market online offline we do a lot of different stuff again we're lucky we've reached a size that makes it um, much easier for us to do that we've got a good marketing team they know what they're doing it works who runs your, you've got to have a mix who runs your marketing team uh, we've got we've got an individual group he's fantastic Huh. A big background in marketing is uh, we've got and, Google and, specialists. We've got lots. We've got different, all of whom help. Wow! See, there, there's another course right there. You could have your marketing people give a uh, give a give a course on a market because in a, in a, because that that's that's patient flow equals cash flow. I mean, there's nothing better for a business than getting a fresh supply of customers. Uh, that, that, our biggest source is still from dentists yeah. and the dentists send them to us because we're not going to steal their patients. So we can't take them on as our own patients. Um, we're not, they're not going to send them to us for an implant and we're going to send them back with one implant, three crowns, four root treatments and a full perio workup done. We're going to send them back with what, with what they asked for, which is an implant. Um, but you've got to you've got to just relinquish that idea that the only one who's capable and skilled enough to restore your implants is yourself. That's brilliant. Train them, teach them, support them. They're fantastic. Okay, Bill, I only got you for three minutes. So for the close, I want you to answer two questions. This dentist is uh, three minutes away from their office, and then they're going to yeah. pull up, and pull up, and get out of the car. And you've inspired and motivated, and they say, "Okay, I am going to commit." someday I'm going to place an implant. So I want you to answer these two questions. Right. At the IDS meeting in Cologne, Germany, there were 100 and I think 45 different companies selling implants. And the second part is what, what, which one should I buy? And number two, what would you, how, what would you recommend I sign up for training? What, what to answer those two questions, what implant system should I buy and how should I get trained? Uh, the big C, secret is that every implant system works if you know how to use it. But when you're starting out, you have no idea how to use it. So you're going to need help. So find out who's nearby you that can discuss cases, talk you through cases, and give you the support and help that you're going to need when you're starting out. And choose the same implant system that they use, because they'll know the tips and tricks to get you out of trouble that you're going to face. Um, once you know how to do it, once you're experienced, you can use whatever implant system you want, but start by using the same one that they do. The second thing was how do you get training? If you choose that system, personally I'd say, right, the system is going to want to support you, they're going to want you to put implants in, they're going to want you to succeed, they're going to have training, and then go to everything that you can find. Look on Dental Town. I've learned, I've learned so much from Dental Town, so much. Um, just absorb yourself, immerse yourself in learning about it. You, you, you never know enough that you can't learn more. And, and you've been on Dental Town a long time. You've been a member since 2003. What, what would you say to someone listening to uh, this podcast on iTunes that's never logged on to Dental Town? What would you say to that person? <laughs> Just log on and see what's there. Um, it's, it's, you've got to have a thick skin on Dental Town because there'll be lots of people that will uh, have a poke, have a go, try and knock you down. That's fine. That's the same as general life. 
Um, but you'll learn a lot. And also, don't just be a lurker. Don't just, don't just hide, you know? Post things. Post your mistakes. Post your successes. Post whatever you like. But get on there and see, what's, see what other people are doing. Because dentistry can be very insular. You're working in your own office. It's very easy to not realize what else is going on around you. So that's it. Just get on there. That, that was why I started in 98, just so that no dentist would ever have to practice solo again. And I want to say something about uh, if, if someone ever says something and, you do, and it made you feel bad, remember, we have a report abuse button with a dozen volunteer dentists, and we read that post, and if we think, you know, you're kind of being a jerk, we tell, we tell that person, you know, hey, say, we either delete the post or we edit it or we say, be nice. Because the way I feel, you know, a lot of people say, well, I have the freedom to, I have freedom of speech because they're, you know, they, they think they're talking to the government and the U.S. Constitution. No, freedom of speech is between you and your government. Dental Town is private property. I'm the only owner and it's a party in my house and two people can passionately disagree as long as they're having a beer and friendly about it. But yeah, exactly. the minute... But the minute you're not friendly and you're being a jerk, you're going to be shown the door. And someone is shown the door more than you'd ever know. I mean, they, they are escorted out regularly. Um, because, you know, they, they, um, you just got to be nice because we're getting beat up by insurance companies and patients. And, you know, you, you just there needs to be a refugee where we can all go. And to have guys like you on there that share so willing. I mean, dude, you've posted 20 over 2,000 times. I mean, I just amazing that you do that. And, uh, and I also think you're very street smart because most people, um, they say, well, if you want to learn implant systems, you got to fly across the country or to a, another country and pay 10000 and go through some course. But that's, that's what book smart people do. Street smart people say, what's the fastest, cheapest, easiest way to learn that? And that's either going to be the online dental, dental town uh, or the guy across the street from you or in the same building. And, and dentists are so scared of going, I mean, you know how many times, Bill, in America, you'll go into a medical dental building and there's eight dentists in there. And you say, dude, when was the last time you went to lunch or breakfast or dinner or out for a beer with the other seven dentists near? And 95% of the time they say, never once in my life. Yeah. I'm like, are you completely insane? And, and, and they'll buy a $150,000 CBCT machine not knowing that their dentist or periodontist or oral surgeon, you could send any patient over there you could drive the patient there and they'd let you take it and they they want to meet yep. you. They they let you walk. Every every human wants a friend, a dog, a cat. You know, everybody wants a buddy. And the street smarts people find a buddy like you up the street and you mentor them. And like I say, yep. if you're using an implant system, use that one. And, and look for an implant system where there's a human in your backyard that uses it or a rep or a, a CE course or support or online support. But, hey, we are out of time, and I just want to sit there and say, dude, I think you are the coolest dude. Um, I, I love your post. Uh, I've been a big fan of yours since 2003. You educate me, and you're so uh, – you, you make me think that all British people are, are, like, proper, like Canadians because when people argue with you, you always start, start so polite and so proper where I'm an American. I just want to say, hey, you're an idiot, blah, 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 and you're just – you share so much. You're so great. Your cases are breathtaking – I've shared a lot of them in social media. So I just want to thank you for not only all that you do for dentistry in the UK and implantology, but for all that you do for Dental Town. And Bill Schaefer, thank you so much for sharing an hour with me. Howard, thank you for setting up Dental Town in the first place. You've made me a better dentist. Take care. And sometime I want to have uh, fish and chips with you in London. Is that what city you're in? Are you in? Uh, you're in Sussex. Where, where's that from London? In Brighton, yeah. Well, I'm, I'm just down the road from Brighton. So right, next time you're in the UK, I'll be mortally offended if you don't get in touch and I'll take you out for fish and chips. You in know, Brighton, they're fresh <laughs> caught, they're on the coast. You know, my, I got four boys, and the only thing they talk about, uh, they still remember and talk about London is not only the big eye, you know, the big Ferris wheel. It's like a 20-story Ferris wheel and all that stuff, but the, the fish and chips. They still talk about the fish and chips because if you're an American, you've never had fish and, fish and chips until you got to London. I mean, you think you've had fish and chips, but you haven't until you got to London. But, Bill, I will see you in London someday. Ask your wife uh, if I could uh, buy you and her a plane ticket to uh, Vegas and uh, uh, meet you in person there. And thanks again. Uh, thank you so much. Bye-bye. You're on. A real pleasure.